It's time to take your seat in the front row with Mike Vaccaro. Here's your host, Mike Vaccaro. Hey, thank you, Chuck, and welcome once again, everybody. Mike Vaccaro here in the front row. As always, behind the scenes, our creator, producer, and director, J.R. Quitman. This episode is for him. Before we get to our guest, we do want to always thank you for watching and listening to our podcast. Be sure to subscribe as well. Great guests coming up as they're starting to pile up, and we'll have those coming your way very soon. Also want to remind you and thank CLNS Media Network. We are part of their podcast group. Check them out. Check out some other great podcasts as well as uh, Cedric Maxwell, one of those guys that has a podcast, one of our previous guests. Well, our guest now is we're up to episode number 54. It's a guy that wore a star on his helmet playing for the Dallas Cowboys, Greg Ellis. Ellis from North Carolina went to UNC, played for Mac Brown with the Tar Heels before getting drafted in the first round by the Cowboys. He shares his journey with us, his welcome to the NFL moment, his quarterback that he liked to sack both in college and pro. It's the same guy. Stick around to hear that. And also what he's doing now. He's coaching and also doing some things on the mental health side. And we'll talk to him about that, share a very special website, important website that you could check out as well. A lot to get into. It is our first guest from the Dallas Cowboys. It is Greg Ellis, the former defensive end. And he joins us now, episode number 54. First of all, Greg, we, we appreciate you spending some time with us. We've had a run of NFL guys here, but they've been offensive guys. We had uh, Mike Quick, wide receiver for the Eagles, Oliver Luck, a quarterback. We had Don Beebe, our, our most recent guest. So we're going to the defensive side. We had to get you on here to talk right. defense for once and, and highlight defense. So we appreciate you joining us uh, to do that. And uh, certainly we'll get into your NFL career, but we want to go to the very beginning for you. You're a North Carolina guy. You're, you're born in Wendell. Grew up uh, in North Carolina. Uh, tell us about sports early in your life. Obviously, you gravitated to football. What else were you playing early on? I played basketball. Um, had some offers to some schools to go play basketball, actually. Um, and just, you know, decided to stick with uh, football. Um, did, people ask, you know, did you do any baseball? Um, I got hit in the eye in a, in a little uh, summer camp. Was playing softball. I got hit in the eye. And I was apprehensive to play baseball anymore, so I didn't play any uh, baseball. But basketball and football uh, were, were my two um, sports that I loved and enjoyed playing. So you were getting recruited. Who was recruiting you to play basketball? Oh, man, some of the smaller schools, Liberty, uh, like UNC, Charlotte, those, those kind of schools in, in that day. Um, that was, you know, it was it was a lot of them actually, and uh, we were we were fortunate, man. We were blessed. We had an amazing high school basketball team um, during that era because we went to. I was a public school, so we couldn't recruit kids. You just kind of got whatever was available, and uh, we were fortunate and blessed to have a, a nucleus of talent um, to be at our school at one time to play basketball, and so we. We didn't win the state championship. We went to the state championship my sophomore year, and we lost in the junior and senior year. Um, we were a game or two short from going back to the state every year. So, you know, uh, claim to fame, a guy named Sean Allen ended up playing uh, at the University of Wake Forest with Tim Duncan. And so we had that kind of talent on our basketball team. Yeah, this is at East Wake High School. Again, you're a multiple sport athlete there, and you were the, the male athlete of the year in 1993. The, the Raleigh News and Observer uh, named you the male athlete of the year. Was that based on not just football solely, but also on basketball as well? Yeah, uh, of course. Of course. Like I said, we you know went really deep in the playoffs every year uh, that I was playing um, high school basketball. And it wasn't just because of me. Like I said, we had a good team. But, um, yeah, I'm pretty sure that contributed a lot to it. Um, to be honored that way. So obviously also getting recruited on the football side of things. Take mm -hmm. us through that, what, what that process was like and how North Carolina maybe stood out among the rest for you. That was crazy. Um, I mean, I, I had trash bags full of letters and, you know, it was, it, it, I cherished every moment of it. And that's why I kept all the letters. And I don't have them to this day. I don't think I do. Um, but I had them throughout, you know, high school. And uh, my first letter was from South Carolina, University of South Carolina. Um, and so it was amazing. My first plane trip actually came by way of South Carolina um, as well. I went there for a visit when 
we're allowed to do our official visits that we're going to places I visit, uh, visit Virginia, of course, North Carolina, and I didn't take the rest of them. I think I just did those three. Um, but, you know, I, I grew up a Tar Heel fan. Um, and of course, you know, everybody knows about the basketball program at Carolina. And so the uh, opportunity to wear the blue was something um, that I lavished at, man. Never thought that I have the opportunity to do it. Um, and so when it when God presented it to me, it was a dream come true. After you, Julius Peppers, he played football and basketball. Did you try to to play basketball at Carolina? Did you oh, did that, yeah. put that out there for them? Yeah, you know what? Got a story. I think I got a story for everything you can think of. Uh, so I get to Carolina, and somehow um, Dean, the great Dean Smith found out. I guess, you know, he was doing all the recruiting, and I was down the street at East Wake. Um, he knew I could play basketball. And so uh, they sent word for me to come out. And so my second year of college, I actually went out and played for his junior varsity team. Um, did, did that for two years. Uh, my second year of doing it, um, Coach Smith used to pull me up to practice with the varsity squad um, sometimes. And that year, it was Vince Carter was there, Antoine Jameson was there. And um, those were two of the, you know, the biggest stars who were there during that um, year. Um, after that season was over, he, he told me, he said, Greg, uh, I want you to come out next year uh, for the varsity team. I originally, I told Coach Smith I would do it, and um, but I was a little different than, than a lot of other guys because when I came to college, I was actually weak. I, I didn't lift weights in high school, and so I had to spend a lot of time in the weight room to get strong enough to play college football. And so when I would practice basketball, I still had to do all the off-season stuff, lifting weights, the running and conditioning and stuff for football. And so, um, I, I, long story short, I decided not to go out for the varsity squad um, that third year of basketball and just to stick with football. Well, well, again, Greg, talking about your your time at Carolina, you were there from 1994 to 1997 playing for Mac Brown. Red shirt your first year. So as you said, you need to get bigger, need to get stronger. But then after that, your red shirt freshman season, four sacks that year. And the numbers started to come after that. Take us through the progress and, and again, getting there, getting red shirted, but getting stronger during that time as well. Yeah. And that's for me, you know, nowadays, um, kids come in more ready to play because, you know, high school football, you know, you're, you're lifting weights and you're doing the almost the college stuff already. Um, but in those days, uh, a lot of kids played multiple sports, um, especially basketball. And so and playing basketball and, and, you know, you got the AAU basketball and the school basketball and it was just basketball, basketball, basketball. Uh, for you if you were a decent basketball player in those days. So I didn't, I didn't have the time to to lift weights. Um, and it just got get the raw ability allowed me to be successful playing football in high school. Uh, but, you know, when I got older and hit college, man, those guys were real strong and um, it just the talent wasn't enough. And so Coach Brown and his staff, they saw that early and um, allowed me to red shirt and, and – to be honest with you, they redshirted our entire class that year. Um, us guys that came in in 1993, um, but that pro that time when we all redshirted really jumped our football program. Um, and they started to improve, and obviously before we got there. Um, but when you look at that group of guys in 1993, um, you had two first rounders um, in that program um, during that year. 1993 year came out of 1998. Um, Vonnie Holiday, which came in the year behind us, he didn't red shirt though. So the year we came out, it was three first round picks. So um, allowing us to red shirt and develop and get acclimated to college, I think, was a good move by Coach Brown and his staff. Yeah, when you look at it defensively, you guys had what the number two ranked defense, both your mm -hmm. junior and your senior season. So you you give credit to that that red shirt year and helping build that maybe camaraderie and again build your bodies as well. It, it was, you know, the thing about it now, Coach Brown and his staff, they had to be patient. And what they did, they went out and recruited just really good athletes, to be honest with you, like guys that could flat out run. And, and that all of us could. We were undersized, not super duper strong. And a lot of them were stronger than me. But, you know, all of us were good 
athletes that could just run like a deer. And, you know, he took that year, like I said, our freshman year and redshirted us and under the um, watchful eye of um, Jeff Mad Dog um, grew us and got big, strong and faster. And um, it just helped take that program to another level. Well, you ran like a deer and you sack quarterbacks uh, in your career, 32 and a half sacks at, at North Carolina. Do you remember some of the quarterbacks, any of those sacks that really stick out in your mind during that time? I don't remember uh, the a lot of the names of the quarterbacks. Um, well, you know what? Uh, Donovan McNabb was one of them. And uh, and I remember Donovan, man, it, it seemed like he was a nightmare for me, to be honest with you, because, you know, I chased him around. We played Syracuse, I think, two or three years that I was there, and he was in at Syracuse. Um, and then we get to the NFL, of course. I have to play against him every year because uh, he was at Philly and I'm at Dallas. Um, another quarterback, uh, the kid, well, he ain't a kid, he grown. Now, um, Hamilton from, from Georgia Tech. Yeah. Um, Georgia Tech in those days ran that option, and so it was always hard to get, to, to get your hands on him because he, you know, was a good scrambling quarterback running the option. Um, but those – well, again, you, you look at your career and you continue to progress through it. 1996, first team all ACC, second team all American, and then the same thing, first team all ACC in 97, but first team all American. Could could you feel your progress through your career? Of course, uh, of course. You know, um, that first year of playing, I played behind Marcus Jones and a guy named Oscar Sturgis, which Marcus was the first round pick to um, Tampa Bay. And um, Oscar, I don't remember what round he was, but he actually played for Dallas as well, um, Oscar Sturgis. And so those guys, you know, they made sure I got playing time. Uh, that first year that I went out and started playing, I would just kind of relieve them some. And then after that, you know, I was had to start and play a whole bunch. And so I saw the progression of, um, you know, fortunately me getting better and better, becoming a better football player. Um, but guy named Donnie Thompson was my position coach. Coach Carl Tor Torbush was the coordinator for us. And um, they obviously did a good job of helping me develop as a football player as well. And as a team, your last two years, 21 and three, uh, do you look back at those times fondly and, and, and some of the matchups, obviously a lot of rivalries for you in the ACC as well during that time? Exactly, man. You know, uh, I would say this, <laughs> and no disrespect to any of the programs, but, you know, the tides, it's funny how the tides of winning and losing change. They go back and forth um, because when we were there, you know, we never lost against Duke, although we had some close games against Duke. Uh, we never lost against NC State. Uh, we never lost against um, Wake Forest. So for us, our colleges that were in the state of North Carolina, you know, we never lost to them. Um, but, you know, since then, things have changed. And congratulations to those programs. Um, but, you know, it's it's it goes in waves. And uh, we had a good high wave when we were there, thank God. And, uh, you know, it, it has gone back and forth right now. So uh, and hopefully Carolina gets back on top of all three of them. <laughs> yeah. And to see your your coach come back as well. I mean, obviously, the success you guys had helped him get to Texas gets out of football for a while and comes back. Uh, what's it like having him back around and, and following the progress of this team now? It, it's been great. You know what I mean? I mean, he invites um, us back, the homecoming and the home games, and to be involved with the program as much as we can. Um, he he has some guys that actually played with him at Carolina on that first go round, And so it's it's been great, man. It's been amazing. Um, you know, I hate that he had um, – it didn't work out for him to, to never have left Carolina, to be honest with you. Um, but, you know, you understand that the, the job has a business side to it and that part had to get taken care of. Uh, but I'm glad he's back now and looking forward to Carolina to continue to grow. And again, for you, all-time sack leader, 32 and a half sacks during your time there in Chapel Hill – your number 87 jersey retired and honored at Kenyon Stadium. What kind of honor is that for you? That's amazing, right? Um, I have taken my kids back there and, and I'm walking to the stadium. And um, it's I think it's it's amazing because they get to go and see something that their dad was blessed to be a part of um, that still remains today. 
Um, and, you know, the talent God's blessed me with, um, the hard work that I um, had to, had to um, apply in order to have those honors to happen, um, I think is a good example um, that you can share with your kids and, and not just your kids, but all people that they can understand, you know, the um, sacrifice um, and the hard work it takes uh, for something like that to happen. But when you're willing to put that kind of hard work into something, and if, you know, God has blessed you with the talent, um, that's what can happen. You can be uh, remembered forever. And remembered alongside, uh, I mean, again, you're great for Chapel Hill. Also, Lawrence Taylor, Julius mm -hmm. Peppers, again, and you, you, you know, outpace those guys. That's you know, that, that's got to be impressive to you and impress you to what you were able to do, as you said, came in kind of uh, not as strong as you needed to be. But to see where you were five years later is be it's a, it's just amazing. Yeah. Yeah. You, you are right. And uh, with Julius and I don't know how Lawrence Taylor came in because he was, you know, ahead of me. But to have a guy, it didn't have to be me, but it just was me. But to have a guy that came in as weak, as undeveloped as I was for as a football player, um, I, it, it's, it's, it's a tribute a lot to the strength coach. Um, again, Jeff Madden, uh, mad dog. We call him, um, coach Brown, coach Torbush, uh, coach Donnie Thompson, all of those guys are recruiting coach, coach Daryl Moody, um, just to have the vision to see what I can develop into. Um, I remember coach Moody telling me that, you know, Greg, you come in here at Carolina, we're going to put a little weight on you, get you big and strong. I couldn't see it as a 17 year old kid. Um, but I'm, I thank God that those coaches had the foresight to see what I could develop into. Um, it doesn't nullify me from not having to do the work because I, you know, applied myself to do it, but they had the vision to see what I can, could develop into. Well, what you developed into was a first round pick in the NFL in 1998, eighth overall taken by the Dallas Cowboys. So you're drafted by America's team, the Cowboys. What was that <laughs> moment like for you? Man, that was great. I remember getting the call. Um, Jerry called and asked, you know, how would I like to have a um, star on my helmet? And I said, yes, sir, I would love to have a star on my helmet, especially if it's going to be in the first round. Uh, that makes the star even better. Um, but it, it was a, just an amazing um, thing to happen. Um, you know, I, you you just it's, it's unbelievable to be honest with you um for to get that call um, to get it that early um if you would uh, but it's it's been great and, and as you mentioned the defense was really good you look at the that first round that year 1998 mm -hmm. you're taking eighth the Bengals take uh Brian Simmons 17th and then Bonnie mm -hmm. Holiday goes 19th to Green Bay I mean that's certainly a testament to how good your defense was at Carolina right yeah, exactly. I mean, you're, you're hard pressed and I hadn't did the research, but I would imagine there are not a lot of schools that have three first round picks in one year on their football team, let alone on one side of the football. Right. Um, that you got three first round picks on the defensive side of the football. And then when you look at that whole defensive team, really the whole team, you look at guys like um, Omar Brown, who got drafted, like he went to Atlanta. Um, Dre Blotted next year, or two years later, get drafted, I think, to Detroit. Um, uh, Robert Weir. It, it's pretty much that whole, the entire defense um, had an opportunity to play in the NFL, pretty much. The linebackers, K. Mays went to Green Bay. I think he got drafted by, no, got drafted by Minnesota. Um, guy named Keith Newman. A year or two later, Keith get drafted. I forgot who he got drafted by. But it's like that whole team, especially on the defensive side, ended up getting drafted. And the one guy who didn't get drafted probably had a better career than all of us. That's a guy named um, Nate Hobgood Chittick. Uh, you probably never heard of Nate. Yeah. And, and Nate, um, God rest his soul, he, he's passed now. Uh, but Nate, go, as a free agent, goes and plays with the Rams. And when Torrey Holt and those guys were up there winning the Super Bowl, oh, Nate Hobgood Chittick was right alongside of him uh, playing on the defensive line. He didn't start, but he played and, um, and contributed to them winning. And um, he got a Super Bowl out the deal. And so you had guys like that who didn't even start on our defense that ended up still making it to the NFL and playing some NFL snaps. 
Yeah, certainly uh, college football is a different time now. Offense is, is so much present and prevalent more than the defense, but uh, you guys are uh, great defensive teams there in the yeah. late 1990s. And let's dive into your time now with, it, with the Cowboys because it was a okay. long time with the Cowboys, 11 years overall, right, 1998 to 2008. And you were a, a mainstay, start 155 of your 162 games. When you look back at your time there, again, America's team to be such a mainstay, what does that say about you and, and how good you were during that time? To me, it, it says a lot about the stock and the people that played a role in my life, that God has placed in my life to pour into my life. Um, I, I think that's what it really says a lot. Um, and I encourage anybody that may see this um, this taping to understand and never forget the opportunity to learn is always around the opportunity to learn. But you have to be willing to absorb the information that's set before you. Um, it doesn't always come in the classroom, but that opportunity is always there. And I thank God that, you know, for the most part, I capitalize on those opportunities to learn uh, and apply them to my life, in which I still do to this day. Um, and that has helped me tremendously uh, in my personal life. Well, you had to learn as well because you started at the defensive end. When Bill Parcells came in, he made you an outside linebacker. What kind of transition is that for, for a guy that's, again, used to being a defensive end and then, you know, different setting, different role as a linebacker? It, it was – it was – Difficult. The difficultness of it was not necessarily me playing the position, but it was the mental of me thinking about the position, if you would, because my whole career, I mean, I, I've stood up and rushed before some in Carolina, but not as an outside linebacker. You know, I, it was just, OK, let's try to let's try to hide Greg, disguise something, but you're still going to come out the edge. Um, but to have to play a true linebacker, right? Uh, to drop in coverage and covering people and that kind of stuff. I've never had to do that on a consistent basis. And so um, it, it took some, some getting used to, if you would, and it had some frustrating days, um, if you would. Uh, but thank God it worked out. I remember we was playing um, Seattle. It was a preseason game. And uh, – the I forgot who caught the ball, but somebody kept catch the ball in the flats, and I'm out there on coverage. And it, it was like the play was in slow motion. It was like, okay, here's the opportunity. And and I, and I remember thinking, I told Bill this wasn't a good idea because I'm thinking I'm going to miss this open field tackle because as a defensive lineman, you don't have too many wide open field tackles that's one on one like that. Um, but I made the tackle, and you know it definitely helped build my confidence to say that I can play this outside linebacker position. But the interesting thing was how and when Bill shifted me to the outside linebacker position. We were in practice. We were in practice in training camp in Oxnard, and you know just a regular practice going on. And Bill calls me over. He said, "Greg, you know, come here." So I come over. I say, "Yes, sir. What's up?" He said, I want to, uh, today, I want you to play outside linebacker. No, he said, I want to move you to outside linebacker. I want to try you to outside linebacker. And I'm like, oh, boy. I said, okay, well, when, when are we going to try it? When you want to do this? And he says, today, right now. I said, Bill, you, I don't know anything about that. We hadn't did any practice, and no coaches had met with me to tell me nothing about it. And he's like, don't worry about it. It'll be all right. You can do it. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> And so uh, that's how he threw me in the deep end of the pool with no paddles uh, to figure out how to play linebacker. Well, if, it, if it's not Bill Parcells, do you, do you kind of trust him as much as maybe you did because it was Bill Parcells? Yes, yes, because it was Bill Parcells. And, you know, he's produced a lot of great football. I mean, Lawrence Taylor, for one, you know what I mean? He produced a lot of great athletes, man, and and, and obviously he has coached those guys. Uh, and, you know, he coached me along the way, and, you know, he, he critiqued me, and uh, Willie McGinnis was a guy um, that he, you know, used to compare me to a lot. He was like, I think Willie was still playing in those days. And he said, Greg, uh, just like Willie McGinnis, he's like, y'all the you know, same kind of size, you're the same kind of guy. So I know you can do it. And uh, like I said, obviously it worked out, worked out good. When you came in, they still had a lot of the star power. You still had Troy Aikman and Emmett Smith and Michael Irvin mm -hmm. on the offensive side, big names on the defensive side as well. 
I would imagine there's always pressure when you're the Dallas Cowboys to win. Yeah. Was it was there early on in your career, especially with those, even though they were kind of toward the tail end of their careers, you still had the big names. Was there always pressure for you guys to win? Of, of course, there there was pressure because I remember when I got when I got drafted, we were in Durham still um, before we flew down here for the visit, um, and reporters were asking me, you know, the Dallas Cowboys they didn't make the playoffs that year. But I w- I grew up, excuse me, I grew up with the Dallas Cowboys winning Super Bowls in the 90s. And so, you know, I remember looking at them when I was in high school and them winning the Super Bowls. So I was certainly accustomed to the Dallas Cowboys winning. And I remember telling that reporter, it's like, man, they're the Dallas Cowboys. They're going to come back. It's going to bounce back and they're going to win Super Bowls. And I'm very blessed and fortunate to be a part of it. Um, but Lo and behold, it didn't work out that way. Um, but I am happy that, you know, I got the chance to contribute. Um, and for the reason they drafted me was to have a uh, an anchor at the defensive end position that could go out there and start and um, and hold his side down. And I thank God I was able to, to do that. I didn't take away from the football team. Um, a lot of people, you know, said, well, they could have drafted Randy Moss. And I tell people, it's like, well, I was the eighth pick. Randy Moss wasn't the ninth pick. So there was still a whole bunch of team that could have drafted Randy Moss. Um, and Randy had a great, great Hall of Fame career. And I never, you know, throw anything to slander against that. Um, but for what the Dallas Cowboys were looking for, um, Jerry was trying to get, you know, one or two more Super Bowls out of those guys, out of Troy, Emmitt, uh, Michael Irvin and those kind of guys. And so he knew he needed a defensive end that can come in and play. Um, and and I, I'm glad I was able to come in there to do that. Um, I started uh, my first the, – the first game, right? And so to come in there and, and, and hold it down to give the team what they were looking for is what um, I was asked to do, and I'm, I'm glad I did it, was able to do it. Yeah, you, you more than held it down during your career. Some of your numbers, 77 sacks as a Cowboy, 377 tackles. And in 1999, you scored two touchdowns. Now, it wasn't a little pick up a fumble, run five yards. No, 87-yard interception return for a touchdown, 98-yard fumble return for a touchdown as well. Take us through those two moments because I'm sure the defense was loving seeing you make those type of plays. Yeah, you're exactly right. And the ironic thing about it, um, Mike, was that the 87-yard touchdown, of course, that's my college jersey number. Uh, the 98-yard touchdown, of course, that was my NFL um, jersey number. So um, I thought that was very ironic. Still waiting to find out the meaning, you know, <laughs> why God had it to happen like that, but I don't know. Um, and, I, and I don't really remember which one came first. But what I do remember off the first one, I think it was against Atlanta, the first one, the interception. And so Chandler, I think, was the quarterback for, for, what's, for um, the Falcons that year. And literally, I would like to tell you that he threw the ball and I made this amazing break on the ball, but he really threw it straight to me. So I just had to make sure I caught the ball and um, and, and don't trip over my own self. And so thank God I caught it and ran it in. And so I'm, I'm tired. I get to the sideline and I'm sitting down sucking on oxygen. And um, Troy Aikman comes up to me and Troy tells me, he said, Greg, man, make sure you enjoy it because it, 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 no, he said it'll never happen again in your career. And, you know, nine times out of 10, he's right. Um, that's a defense alignment's dream to be able to score a touchdown. And it happened for me very early, my second year. Well, um, as you already stated, the next game we play Arizona and they're on their um, about two yard line driving in to score and it's on our two yard line. I mean, and so they run the ball, we stop them. But the ball comes out. The running back fumbles the ball, and it's sitting there on the ground. So I grab the ball, and I'm really going to lay on it. A guy named Darren Woodson, he pulls me. He's yanking on my arm, telling me to get up. Nobody touched me. So I get up and see nothing but green grass. And I'm like, okay, well, going to have to run. <laughs> and so it, it, it was a convoy of us Dallas Cowboys players running 98 yards down the field. But now, Mike, I'm dead tired when I get there. But you can imagine what I do. I don't run to find the oxygen. 
I run to find Troy Aikman. <laughs> and I, I get Troy. Now, Troy is not coming over to congratulate me. He's, you know, talking to somebody else. And so I tapped him. I said, Troy, I thought you said it would never happen again. And, of course, he just busts out and start laughing. Um, but that was, you know, a very memorable moment for me. Um, so, yeah, that was some good times. And you mentioned Darren Woodson. Uh, he's the finalist right now for the Hall of Fame as well. So you play for, with a lot of Hall of Fame oh, yeah. caliber guys and guys that are in the Hall of Fame as well. And mm -hmm. again, success early on. But but do you have a, a welcome to the NFL moment? Maybe a, a moment early on where things didn't go quite as well, and you realized, hey, this is a, a different speed, a different <laughs> game than it was in college. Uh, it first happened for me when I was a rookie, man. Uh, it was in training camp, right? And so uh, Larry Allen, one of the best offensive linemen to ever played in the NFL, uh, benches 700 pounds. That's his, that was his max, more than any NFL player has ever done. And so anyway, we in training camp and we hit each other and he knocked me off the ball. That means, you know, he came with more force than I did and I get driven back. And I remember going into my dorm room that night and I was talking to my wife and she could tell, she was like, Greg, what's wrong? You sound down. And I told her, I said, man, today I got knocked off the ball and I'm not used to that happening to me. You know, I'm not that weak kid that, that came out of East Wake no more. I'm pretty strong right now, but you know, I get knocked off the ball and I didn't know who Larry Allen was at that level. I mean, I knew him as a teammate, but not knew, not know him as the Larry Allen, if you would. And so, um, uh, my wife tells me, she said, Greg, uh, if it's too much for you, you said you could, we could just give the money back and we can go back to North Carolina and just, you know, live regular lives and get jobs. And I told her, I was like, no, we're not going to do that. I'm going to go back out there and, you know, man up. And so that next day in practice, man, you know, we hit. And it's probably good I didn't know who he really was because I probably would have kind of accept that defeat and said, okay, he does this to everybody. But we hit really, really hard, man. And the the all the guys out there, you know, they erupt and, you know, start yelling and screaming because it was a huge collision. Um, but yeah, that was a serious welcoming to the NFL for me. Uh, and then another time we was in a preseason game. Uh, I think this was against Seattle as well. It was at home. And a guy named Jim Jeffcoat was my position coach. Um, Jim played for the Cowboys earlier. And so he's going through the scouting report, like right before the game starts, because it's a preseason game. You really don't scout your opponents. It's about, you know, your team. But he takes the time to go through it right before the game starts. And so he's reading that scouting reports. He said, um, Greg, the guy you're going to be going against, his name is House Ballard. He's, um, you know, 300 pounds, whatever, this and that. And he played uh, like either 12 or 15 years. Man, I remember I was like, are you serious? And I literally said it before I caught myself. I said, you serious? And he said, yes. Because in my mind, I had a hard time conceptualizing. Like, I'm like 22, 23 at the most. And this dude has been playing like 12 or 15 years. Y'all expect me to go against him? And uh, and so we get into the game, Mike. And and this guy, you know, sure enough, he's doing the veteran thing. He's, like, staring me down, trying to intimidate me. And so, man, I remember dropping my eyes. And, Mike, it was almost like I closed my eyes. And I fired off the ball as hard as I could. Didn't worry about trying to make the play. But I realized I have to establish something here. And, um, and I hit that guy, hit the house as hard as I could. And when the game was over, House told me, he said, um, he said, young blood, you, you're going to be all right in this league. You're going to be able to do it. So, um, yeah, those are some some eye opening. You're in the NFL moments um, that I had to deal with. Well, certainly players here that, that made you better as well, I would think. Again, going up against somebody, the caliber of Larry Allen, a Hall of Famer mm -hmm. as well himself to face him in practice on a daily basis. That had to make you get better, right? I mean, you had to improve oh, yeah. going up against somebody like that. Yeah, him, Eric Williams, another great um, offensive, offensive tackle, uh, Flozell Adams. So, yeah, man, I we had an amazing offensive line. And to have to work against those guys every day, um, it did. It helped me and several other defensive linemen um, to get better. In the middle of uh, an outstanding career with the Cowboys, 2006, an injury, an Achilles injury at Washington. 
Mm -hmm. Take us through, through that moment. What do you remember about that moment? And, and was it maybe your first serious injury that you've had in your career? Well, that second year after those touchdowns, I actually I broke my leg. Okay. Um, and so I, I didn't finish that second year. I, I had to um, have surgery and they had to um, put a rod inside of my leg. Um, and, and, and take a wild guess who we were playing, who I was chasing. Donovan McNabb, <laughs> same guy from college. It's still causing nightmares for me. Um, but like you said, the 2006 Achilles tear, I mean, it was actually in Arizona, um, Mike. And, you know, that was that was tough. I mean, the toughest thing about it, Mike, was, you know, I, I go down on the field and, you know, when you tear your Achilles, you don't realize it's broke because you kind of just felt like somebody stepped on the back of your heel. Uh, but you're like, man, why can't I walk on this? What's going on? Um, that means your Achilles is torn. Um, when they got me in, they carted me in, and I remember sitting on the table, the me the uh, medical table, and the trainer, not the trainer, the doctor, our doctor, Dan Cooper, who he still, he does my kid surgery if they have anything going on with them still to this day, a great doctor. But he tells me, he, he says, Greg, you had a great career. And I was like, well, wait a minute, can we, can we fix it? <laughs> And he said, yeah, oh, yeah, it's no problem to fix. But at your age and the position you play, you probably won't be able to return to that same level. And so, you know, I'm just kind of preparing you for it. Um, and that was, that was you know, eye-opening for me that that was probably going to be it. Um, but, you know, God had a different plan. Uh, blessed me to have the surgery that went good. The rehab went good. Guy named Head, not Head Train, but a trainer named Brett Brown did a great job of rehabbing my leg um, and come back, uh, Mike. And I was the NFL comeback player of the year that next year, man. And so that, um, you know, it's nothing that I or nobody else can take the credit for. I personally give all that credit and thanks to God for gracing me. Um, with, you know, several more years of playing football at a high level. Yeah, the injury came in your ninth year. So to come back, as you said, to come back player of the year that year, also a Pro Bowl year for you as well. And yeah. in 13 games, 12 and a half sacks, it was your best year yeah. in, the, in the NFL. I mean, what did it take to get back to that level after such a devastating injury? You know, and that's what I said. I, I tell people it was God just saw fit to allow me um, to do that. And, and what I would say, uh, Mike, I learned during those years, man, to be very – to become very proficient at what I was doing because the doctor was right. I wasn't going to be as fast as I was before the tear. I wasn't going to be able to, you know, to stop on a dime and change direction as quick as I usually um, have done um, prior to tearing my Achilles tendon. And so – I had to become very proficient at pass rushing to figure out you can't rely just on speed and strength to get to this quarterback anymore. And so the he and eye coordination stuff, uh, people around the NFL still to this day, you know, they talk about, you know, my hand speed um, and it's not me bragging, but it had to develop even more because, you know, I, I wasn't as fast as I used to be uh, in, in a, in a, in a, an example of that, um, after I came back, I pick up a fumble against the New York Giants, I believe. Now, when you talk about those two recover those two returns for 87 yards and 98 yards, nobody catches me. But, you know, after that Achilles, man, I pick up a fumble and I'm thinking, all right, here we go. We're going to score this touchdown. I get caught by offensive linemen, man. <laughs> One of the New York Giants offensive linemen. So I wasn't as fast as I used to be. And the funny thing about that was after the game, we won that game. And Bill Parcells says, he was like, Ellis, you was running so slow. I thought I was going to have to use a calendar to time you. <laughs> 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 well, well, you were slower, but you were smarter because you were a veteran presence at that time. So that certainly helped you out there. there you but, uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, offensive lineman catches you. Eh, not as not as good as you were earlier <laughs> in terms of speed. But for you, again, a, a great career with the Cowboys, 11 years. Unfortunately for you, it comes to an end June 2nd, 2009, when they decide to release you, go in a different direction. Mm -hmm. what is, what's that like for you? Again, you'd been a Cowboy your entire life, a first-round pick. And now you're getting released and, and maybe learning about the, the business side of things a little bit. And, and, and I, you know, I knew about it, um, the business side for a while. And I was 
and I saw the writing coming for a while because, you know, the way it works, man. I mean, when I tore my Achilles tendon, they drafted a first round pick, uh, outside linebacker, first round pick that next year. And so, and I wasn't mad at him. I understood. It's like, okay, Greg, great player. We love Greg, but you know, the doctor already told us he probably, he's not going to return at the same level. Um, and so you, you know, you got to protect your team and they did that. So I thought it was going to release me then. Um, but they didn't, right. They kept me. Um, and I go out there and play, become the NFL comeback player of the year, go to my first pro bowl, um, have more sacks than I had in any other year with less games played in, in any other year. Um, so they kept me. I um, mean, it kept me a couple more years, as you said. Um, but it does come to an end for all of us, the great Tom Brady. You know, it, it, it all good things come to an end. And, um, you know, I wasn't exempt from that. Um, but I would say this to players, man. Make sure that you have something else going on outside of football. Because for me, in those days, uh, I had a photography company, photography and video company going on. And obviously, I didn't need the money. Um but, you know, it was something that I enjoyed doing and being a part of. And so we would go around um, schools, taking the daycare pictures for the little kids and stuff. Now, I, I don't do it myself. I don't I don't know how to take pictures or, or video or anything. Um, but that was my thing. That's what I did on the side in my spare time. And so it helps cushion that blow. Matter of fact, when I got released by Dallas, I went to one of these um, offices that, you know, we was working out of to pick up some pictures and I was going to take them to this daycare school. And the, one of the ladies who was working for me, she says, why are you here? You're supposed to be in practice. And I told her what happened. And she said, Oh no, I can't let you go deliver these pictures. You just, you know, you got released. You just go home and we'll make sure we get the pictures out there. Um, but again, that helped me tremendously. Um, and, and make sure that you push yourself to stay on the top of your profession. Like me, you know, I tore my Achilles tendon. Physically, I couldn't do some of the things, but I worked, I studied the game, became more a student to the game, and it helped me to remain at the top. And so before I got home from the complex that day, Mike, I've already had, my agent had already talked to the Raiders and they were sitting there with a $10 million contract, you know, ready for me to go before I even got home. But if I would have given into it and say, woe is me and ended up with hardly, you know, no, no production, um, that phone call wouldn't have been waiting for me. So just, you know, I want to encourage the guys, you know, that time, that tough time comes for all of us, man, but it's your responsibility to make sure that you are protecting the investment, which is yourself. So make sure you're working hardest at the top of your game, the top of your craft. So when you do get released, if you want to continue to play, you have that opportunity. Yeah. Two weeks later, basically you get signed by the Raiders, as you mentioned there uh, one more year and then uh, retirement. It was, was that on your mind during that time? You were, you, you I guess you thought you still had a little bit left in the tank, but, but when did retirement kind of start to creep in? Well, when I got there, see, as you know, I've been blessed to be at one team for 11 years. And so my wife and our kids, it was, it was good for us to be settled for that long. Um, and so to, to move out to, to the Bay area, um, it was challenging and, opportunity came for, for me to, to get out, if you would, uh, with a clean slate. And so I said, yeah, I, I'll take that opportunity. And what it was, um, I'll, you know, I was on a three-year contract, but I had some guarantees in a contract. Al, after that first year, he wanted to renegotiate that contract. And so they released me in order to renegotiate it. And so when they did that, you know, I opted to say, you know, appreciate the times, but 12 years, um, it's been real, it's been good, um, but I'm I'm done. You know what I mean? And so we exercised that option, and uh, and that was it, man. You mentioned Al, Al Davis, the owner of the Raiders. So you played for Al Davis for a year. You played for Jerry Jones as well. Can, can you have played for bigger-named no. owners in your NFL career? No, no. I, I tell people – I've been really blessed to play for two of the best owners and that got to be in NFL history. At least, you know, instrumental guys. When you look at, you know, Al Davis and what he's brought and did for the game, 
um, if I'm if I'm correct, I think Al is responsible. I was told for players having the names on the back of their jerseys. Um, Al was one of the pioneers that allowed minority guys, black football players, to play on his teams. Um, Jerry Jones was and still is leading the way in creative marketing. I mean, when Jerry came in the NFL, uh, some people didn't like him because he shook up how they were doing things. But he pushed that envelope. And now you better believe all the teams appreciate what Jerry brought to the NFL uh, when it comes to marketing. Yeah, certainly both those owners, uh, innovators in their own way. Uh, yeah. as, as you mentioned, again, you were doing some things during your playing days and you, you were mm-hmm. you're a TV producer uh, and mm-hmm. film producer as well. What, what got you into that? A couple of movies, you had a movie, Carter High, and then some plays mm-hmm. as well that, that you've produced. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. What, what interested you into doing that? For me, I majored in communications when I was in college and uh, we did a lot of theater stuff, man. Um, and I really never thought I would get the opportunity to, to use it. Um, but, you know, I, I did, and I still use it to this day. Uh, when people ask the question that you just asked, what, what you know, why do I do it? How does a uh, retired football player do and why, why does he do things like that? And for me, and it sounds generic, but it's really to help people. I enjoy helping people. <clears throat> One of the best ways to help people is to help people to be educated or enlightened about certain topics and issues. And one of the best ways to educate you about those topics and issues is through entertainment. And so if I can put something on screen and make you laugh, make you cry and have a message you know, behind it, uh, that's going to help you. You are going to retain that information. And uh, that's my purpose and what I, what I do, what I enjoy doing. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, again, your plays Watch Night, pl- the play, and Juneteenth mm-hmm. play as well. So uh, some things that, that certainly had an impact, as you said, while entertaining yeah. people as well. Well, you're, you're- and, and I, and Let me say this, Mike. Uh, if, if people, I'm going to ask people to go check us out. We're doing a mental health uh, movie. We, it's, it's, we filmed it last year, a whole year ago. And so we've been working editing um, for over a year now. And so uh, that should be coming out. We're shooting to get it out this May. I'm doing mental wellness month. Uh, and I just want to encourage people, go check check us out on getting my help. It's just G-E-T-T-I-N-G-M-Y-H-E-L-P.com, gettingmyhelp.com. And you can see some of the videos that we have up there. And you can see what we're doing. It's a platform that we're allowing people, asking people to share their personal bouts with their you know, mental health battles. And um, the other side of it has a resource tab where we are creating a library for um, professional counselors, mental health uh, providers, care providers, I should say, uh, where they can get, oh, there you go. You already got it pulled up. Uh, so they can get help and um, that type of thing. So they're still working on the site now, um, but just, you know, encourage people to go check it out and click on that, uh, re- click on that um, testimonial page and you'll see those videos in, uh, in, uh, yep, you see the videos right there even too. Um, Eric Warfield played with the Arizona court, not Arizona, Kansas City Chiefs. He's one of the guys that's on our, um, in the testimonial page. Uh, Michael Gaines played with Carolina Panthers. He's one of the guys as well. Uh, and several other guys have agreed to, to help out. That Prescott has, Charles Haley, um, man, uh, Court Ron Leaf um, has agreed to, to help us out with it as well. And so, uh, so that, that's, that's what I enjoy doing, man, is, like I said, helping people uh, through entertainment. Well, and, and mental health has become a big subject in the, in the country now, and it was a, kind of a stigma to talk about it maybe during your playing days as well. But do you see kind of things, you know, changing in that regard? And mental health is, is becoming a big part, especially after the pandemic, during the pandemic. I think because of that, you know, a lot of people realize that mental health is, is an issue in this country. Yeah, yeah it, it really is, man. And, you know, I feel bad for people who, um, who were dealing with it especially extreme cases um, when it was so taboo to even talk about. And so you imagine to have to suffer in silence, um, lonely rooms and all of that kind of stuff. 
uh, you know, a big inspiration for me to do this movie actually um, is is because of Junior Seau. Uh, and it's interesting because I never met Junior Seau that I can remember of. Um, but after he had an amazing football career, I, I don't know what happened, but, you know, he ended up, um, you know, committing suicide there. And so I, I don't know his family, don't know anything about him. But, you know, you look at a guy like Junior who – for years was the poster child for the NFL. And when that was over, you know, he ended up taking his life, ending his life. And so, you know, prayerfully when people see this movie, it will be something to help them from, you know, crossing that bridge and to the, um, to suicide um, and encouraging people to get the necessary help. And that's critical I, I really strive on that word necessary help. So you got to make sure that you're getting the right help um, and not the wrong help. Marion Barber is another guy. I play with Marion, as you know, um, you know, struggle with just mental wellness issues. Um, and the list goes on and on and on. And so um, preferably, you know, we can get this movie out and people see it and, um, and it'd be a blessing and help a lot of people. Yeah. I mean, uh, Hey, it's great to be a pro athlete, right? Fame, yep. you get fortune. But again, sometimes when that ends, it's a tough transition, isn't it? To go from being that guy, being that professional athlete, that's what you do. And now what's next? I mean, luckily for you and other guys as well, but for you in particular, you've found other outlets and, and now coaching has become one of those outlets a, a, as well for you. Mm -hmm. What do you get out of that? What, you know, what kind of, uh, you know, rush and feeling do you get out of being a coach now these days? It's, it still falls in line with who I am as a person, and that's helping people. So as a coach, you know, I get the opportunity to pour into a lot of young people. Now, my wife and I, we have our own kids, and we definitely pour our lives into them. Uh, but it's also good to expand that umbrella and reach out to, you know, 100-plus young men and try to help them uh, in their walk of life. And to get to do it in an arena uh, that I love and respect all my life, which is football, um, is a true blessing um, for me. So um, to get to be a part of both of them, man, the, the production world, I love that. Um, football, obviously, I love that. Uh, to, to get to do both of them um, is, is truly a blessing. Now, obviously, you know, the football side consumes more time um, than the other stuff because uh, nowadays, you know, football coaching is a 24-7, 365 days. Matter of fact, it's 380 days a year um, profession, if you would. Uh, but I love it, man. It's, it's great. It, it's great to, like I said, to get to pour into their lives, um, to get the opportunity to scheme and come up and help, you know, work with your offense and defense, special team coordinators to figure out the X and the O's. Um, it, it does complete me uh, with that void of um, for football. You're on the NAIA level, Southwestern Assemblies of God University, your first year last year, mm -hmm. seven and three last year. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, certainly it seems like it's, it's a fit for you. Where do you see your coaching career going? You know, um, everybody wants to progress, right, in everything we, we do. Um, I'm not looking for another job, anything like that. Um, I'm very happy um, working at, we call it SAGU, Southwest Assemblies of God. Uh, it's a great environment. It's a faith-based school. And so um, it's it's great. It's fantastic. Great boss. guy named um, the AD is um, Jesse Godin, a great man. Uh, Kermit Bridges, the president, is, is a great man as well. So loving where I'm at. Um, you know, and we'll see what opportunity God provides. Uh, but for right now, I'm uh, I'm loving loving Southwest Assemblies of God football program. Certainly, some great influences, great coaches that that you've had. Yeah. Do you pull from those guys from a background? Oh man, ourselves? I do. I mean, when I say I do, I really, really do. Um, they it has blessed me to for us to experience the success that we had this last season. Um, you know, it it doesn't guarantee success, but it definitely helped. Uh, and the interesting thing about it is uh, Bill Parcells used to always try to get me to coach him. Mike Zimmer is another one who uh, was my defensive coordinators in those days and ended up the head coach of Minnesota Vikings for several years um, before they let him go. 
Um, and I used to go over there with, with Mike um, Zim to work with those guys um, during the training camp and doing some of the mini camps. Um, and, you know, but him and Bill would always tell me, it's like, man, you have, you got to coach um, because your knowledge of this game, it's, it's a lot of people don't have that. Zim told me, he said, Greg, so I'll go up to Cincinnati. Zim was the coordinator under Marvin um, Lewis. And so and when Marvin was the head coach in Cincinnati and uh, Zim would have me to come up there. No matter of fact, before that, Zim would – he he called me one day. And he said, Greg, you remember you said uh, if I ever wanted you to show me some pass rush stuff, you'll you you will do it. And I said, yeah. He said, would you still do it? I said, yeah, I will, no problem. He said, uh, what about right now? And I'm like, I'm in Dallas at my house. You're in Cincinnati. I said, so you saying right now? I said, where where you at? And he said, I'm sitting in front of your house. <laughs> so he, literally, I opened the front door. He's sitting there, and we walk through my house to the backyard, and he and I are working on pass rush stuff in my backyard. And so he asked me to come up to work with his guys, and I did uh, for about two or three seasons, um, doing training camp, doing mini camp. And uh, so one day he he and the deep and the coaches took me out to dinner and, you know, I'm thinking no big deal. And I mean, they're, they're whining and dining me. And I said, man, you know what? I feel like y'all recruited me. <laughs> and Sam starts laughing. He says, we are recruiting you. And he told me, he said, Greg, I get guys every year that want to work with my guys. He said, but the knowledge that you know, about football, man, he said, uh, a lot of people don't know that, don't have that. And so you definitely, you have to coach. You have to do something. He said, even if you just set up something and allow guys to come work with you, um, you, you got to do something pertaining to football. I um, mean, I told Zim, I said, you know what, Zim, obviously I love football, man, but I know, my, I know myself. I'm guilty of being a workaholic. The NFL welcomes that. And at that time, my kids, our kids were too little, in my opinion, uh, for me to be gone that much. And so that's why I, I never stepped into coaching full time. Uh, and I used to – he went to Minnesota. I would go up there and work with him still. Uh, but I never went over full time to do it. But now, you know, our kids are older. And so um, coaching is something I love and enjoy. And Bill used to tell me, you got to coach, Greg. You got to coach. Um, and so now I'm, I'm, I'm in it, you know, and loving it, man. It's, it's great. I'm glad I waited, um, till our kids got a little older. And so, um, you know, where it's not a huge stress on my family, uh, I'm very involved with their lives. I used to come home late after those late football games, man. You know, we ride flying back from, from Oakland when I was with Dallas, get back at two or three o'clock in the morning. I'm popping up, taking my kids to school. My wife would do it, but, you know, I'm like, no, I want to be a part of this. And so I, and God bless me the opportunity to be a part of that. And so now that part is over. Um, they're older now. Uh, my youngest is 14. And so, you know, it's easier for my wife to, to um, help and do stuff with her. And, and I, I'm still able to make her games, her basketball and volleyball games. So, um, it's it's been great, but yeah, thank God the opportunity for me to coach was still there after all those years. I didn't think it was, but again, God saw fit to um, keep those doors open for me, and so um, I'm ready to go, man, and enjoying it. Yeah, I mean, coaching on it, any level is is such a commitment these days. As you said, the yeah. NFL it would be a lot of time, very time consuming for you. How, again, you're still in the Texas area, so how much are you still tied to to the Cowboys? Do you spend time with them at all? And do you work with somebody I, I, like a Micah Parsons who is maybe similar to, to you in, in the, the talent that he has? No, I haven't ever worked with Michael Parsons. Um, they caught when a um, guy named Charles Talk, what, uh, Taco uh, was his name. I forgot his regular name, but he was a first round pick for Dallas a couple of years ago. Um, and I was over there. Um, and it, we never worked together, but I extended and talked to him and just shared um, some of the knowledge that I have about NFL football and playing with the Cowboys with him. Um, every once in a while, the Cowboys asked me to come over. Uh, matter of fact, one of the times they did it, it was when Dak and um, Ezekiel were rookies, their rookie year. They had me come over to um, to talk to that rookie class, uh, myself and a couple other retired guys. 
Um, so I always do something with them at least once or a couple times a year. Um, I This year, I know I went over to do one of their radio shows. Um, so, yeah, I tend to always do something with them at least once a year, once a season. Yeah, Taco Charlton, the, the guy that yeah. you, you work yeah. with. And, uh, all right, JR, our, our producer, creator, director, he's a huge Cowboys fan. He wants to know from your perspective, are the Cowboys going to win a Super Bowl again in the future? When is it going to happen? Well, <laughs> like I said earlier, uh, I thought we would have won one when I was there. <laughs> uh, that didn't That's happen. not as easy as you think, right? It is not as easy as you think. And so, unfortunately – the clock is always running. And so when you have a good nucleus, you had, uh, we got Dak Prescott, um, Ezekiel, uh, and even going back to Dez Bryant, in my opinion, when you got that, that triple, um, the, the trip, the triplets, as they call it, like with you had Michael Irvin, um, Troy Aikman, Emmitt Smith, um, you had some major powerhouses of guys that can create big plays for you. As they get older, man, the opportunity window closes up if you would not saying they can't do it but you know that opportunity window closes up and now you know with free agent is just all over the place um has evolved the game a whole lot and so that window when you get that nucleus of good solid players that can really make that run they got about a three at the most a three-year window for it to happen if it don't happen, then you start seeing Dez Bryant is no longer with the Cowboys. Um, people are talking about that Prescott. So that window closes up really fast, and then you go into that rebuilding all again, trying to put those pieces back together for that three-year span to try to make something happen. Um, so <laughs> the window is closed, and I'll say yeah. that and leave it at that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, again, you, you look at the dynasties that any of these franchises have had, and it's amazing because it, it is tough to keep it consistent, especially nowadays with free agencies and, and, and everything else going on. But uh, yeah. certainly great perspective there from a guy who had that star on his helmet. Uh, Greg, I appreciate you joining us here today. If, if you showed us the website on the mental health, how can people follow you, maybe your progress with the your football team, or are, are you on social media? How can they follow you there? Man, you know what? I don't, and that's that's what I have to get better at is the social media stuff. And we're working on it because, you know, for that, when we released that movie, the mental health movie, um, you know, my goal is to have ten, at least 10,000 people that are waiting for it to be released and on board and help spreading the word about it. Um, so for right now, I ask people, if you could just go to that website and literally the guy's working on it literally right now, but you still should be able to go there and hit the subscribe button and, uh, you know, leave us your email again. I promise you, I'm definitely not going to bug you. Uh, and it'd be personal to me when we're reaching out to you. And the only thing we're reaching out is to ask that you share it with other people. Um, when we create more content like this movie that's coming up now, um, just share those links uh, with people. You don't have to give any money because money is always great to give, but it's not uh, all about that. Uh, but just be able to to share it. Um, and when you see the website looking like that, that means they're still working on it. Uh, so it, it's that's in the work on it mode, as they explained to me earlier this morning. I'm like, man, what's going on? And they told me, they said, no, we're actually working on it right now. So it's a cleaner look than that. Um, but if you can, you know, just keep going to it. Um, hopefully they'll be finishing in a couple of minutes and just click that subscribe button, um, leave your information, whatever they're asking for. Um, and I personally will get it. It's going to my email and it's not going to be shared with everybody, but we just need the support um, uh, of people that's, you know, going to want to look at it and help spread the word. Yeah, and you see on your, your screen there, gettingmyhelp.com, the, the site yep. to go to. Greg, this has been a, a lot of fun uh, catching up with you. Again, a North Carolina guy and such great success playing for the, the Dallas Cowboys. Can't thank you enough for spending a little time with us and wish you best of luck with the movie and certainly with your, your football team moving forward as yeah. well. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it, Mike. Well, another great story, another great journey shared with us here in the front row. Our thanks to Greg Ellis for taking the time to join us here today, talk about his time at North Carolina in the NFL and what he's doing now as well. Be sure to check out that website and that movie coming out soon featuring and talking about mental health issues here in the country.
Our thanks to you for listening and watching to our show today. Be sure to subscribe. We'll have more great guests coming your way. We thank you once again for watching In the Front Row with Mike DeCaro. Have a great day, everybody.